Peter, thanks very much. Can I uh, just begin by acknowledging my ministerial colleagues who are here with us today, Jerry Brownlee, Nick Smith, uh, all of the dignitaries in the room, of course, Mayor uh, Bob Parker, uh, my parliamentary colleague Leanne Dalziel, and others, uh, dignitaries that are here. Today um, is a little bit different. I, I, um, I often come to Christchurch you know, pretty much on a weekly basis and more often than not come out to your firms or to other events around Christchurch and get up a little bit and shoot the breeze about what I think is actually happening in Christchurch and where the government is uh, taking the rebuild of the city and the wider region. But I said to Peter some time ago, I was keen to come down and give a speech uh, which he was uh, gracious enough to host and the purpose of that was really to make a couple of announcements we're going to do but also to give a bit of a snapshot of what I think is actually taking place uh, where we've come in the last sort of two and a half years because an awful lot has happened and um, it's interesting sometimes just to take a little bit of stock of that. So that's uh, really the purpose of this afternoon's um, address. But let me, I guess, start by saying that um, none of us will ever forget that three years and six days ago, in the early hours of September the 4th in 2010, when Canterbury was shaken by the first of what would uh, turn out, as we now know, a series of very strong earthquakes. The most disastrous, of course, of those was the earthquake which took place at 12.51 on the 22nd of February 2011. I don't think there is anybody who was in New Zealand that day that will ever forget uh, what they themselves felt as the earth shook or the images that they saw beamed across their television sets. They were and they remain very dark days for the people of Canterbury and indeed the people of New Zealand. As a former Christchurch lad who grew up here and went to school here and started work here, it was shocking to see firsthand the huge impacts of the earthquakes. During the afternoon of February the 22nd, I flew to Christchurch and I saw the destruction for myself. I visited again many times in the days and weeks that followed and, many, and met many residents, emergency staff, community leaders and others who were doing the very best they could to respond in the most difficult and challenging of circumstances. I think we can all agree the community showed great resilience and rallied around to support one another in the aftermath. At this point, I want to particularly acknowledge and thank retiring Mayor Bob Parker for the contribution he made uh, both uh, during the emergency response and the subsequent rebuild efforts. Bob, I think I speak for everyone. I say that um, no one will forget the leadership you showed in a time of great uncertainty uh, for the people of Christchurch. Your words were reassuring, and I think they gave people enormous confidence that we would get through the disaster that was unfolding before their eyes. So we want to thank you for that. Despite what you might sometimes read, the relationship between Christchurch and central government is in fact a close one, and we look forward to working constructively with the new mayor and council following next month's local body elections. I also want to acknowledge uh, the leadership roles members of the Christchurch business community, many of whom are here today, played in the aftermath. You yourselves showed great resilience and flexibility to have kept your business operating and employing people during that very difficult period. And I also want to acknowledge the tenacity of the people of Canterbury and their continuing patience as the recovery builds momentum. I also want to say at the outset that the disaster and its aftermath have resulted in quite natural and understandable frustration and unhappiness from some people. That is to be expected given the scale of the dislocation and destruction and of course the complexity of the recovery and rebuild. Things can get very tough when people find their lives turned upside down, their houses in disrepair, their community services disrupted, and simple tasks like driving across town become difficult and time consuming. The government during all of this period has had to make some very difficult decisions. At times trade-offs have had to be made and in a rebuild of such scale and complexity there won't always be perfect outcomes. But I can tell you that we are fully committed to the rebuild and in my view, good progress is being made. 
the start of this term, the national-led government laid out four uh, major priorities. They are to responsibly manage the government's finances, to build a more productive and competitive economy, to deliver better public services, and of course, the rebuild of Christchurch. I want to restate that the commitment to rebuilding Christchurch again here today. The government is determined to keep driving the, mo the momentum of the rebuild. Um, Earthquake Recovery Minister Jerry Brownlee and his associate Amy Adams are working hard on this, supported by their cabinet colleagues. The Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Authority was established in late March 2011 to help with the recovery, and the agency has been extremely busy ever since. CERA is, of course, the lead agency for the delivery of nine of the 24 recovery programs operating under the recovery strategy for the Greater Christchurch area, and it's supporting the agencies that are working on other programs. These programs range from residential red zone dem demolition and clearing to the delivery of major anchor projects in the CBD. I don't think it's a stretch to say that we collectively, central and local government and the local community, face a, a task of enormous complexity and difficulty. A city has been shaken to its core and the rebuild is on a unique and unprecedented scale. To give you some idea of that scale, in the May budget the government increased the total estimated cost of rebuilding Christchurch to around about $40 billion from the previous estimate of $30 billion. The government's share of that cost is now around about $15 billion, up from a previous estimate of $13 billion. Of the budget's confirmed additional funding of 2.1 billion, some 900 million of new capital is to come from the share float revenue, which amongst other things will be spent on the redevelopment of Christchurch and Burwood hospitals. To put these figures in perspective, consider this. $40 billion is about 20% or one fifth of the entire annual GDP of New Zealand. We are not only rebuilding a central business district that has been almost completely destroyed or demolished, but we are in the process of rebuilding and repairing tens of thousands of homes and repairing and replacing hundreds of kilometres of road, water and wastewater pipes. There can be no doubt that we are in the middle of the largest economic undertaking in New Zealand's history. But despite the scale of the challenges before us, my message to you today is a very simple one. We are making good progress. We are rebuilding this place, and our vision is to make it one of the best small cities in the world to live in, to work in, and to raise a family. I want to turn now to the increasing signs of progress. The regional economy actually is steaming ahead here in Christchurch. You may well have noticed, but growth is up, employment is up, unemployment is down, building consents are way up, and retail trade is strong. If you just take a look at the latest ANZ uh, regional trend survey out last month, it showed that Canterbury was dominating every region in New Zealand, with growth in the year to June 2013 of 6.6%, far ahead of the near, next fastest growing region. I think it's almost double uh, what the next fastest region was around the country. At the time, the ANZ noted that over the past 12 months, the rebuild has generated very strong growth in employment, dwelling approvals, commercial building consents, new car registrations and retail trade. The June quarter household labour force survey showed the region's labour markets continuing to strengthen, with the number of people employed growing by 16,800, or 5.5% over the year. At the same time, the employment rate has risen from 63.7% a year ago to just under 68%. In building consents, statistics show just how much is going on. The number of new consents in July was the highest monthly value since 1990 in Christchurch. The current monthly average is around 50% higher than the pre-earthquake monthly average. Sarah's figures also show that 456 new residential dwelling consents were issued in July in Christchurch and 337 in June. Total, uh, June total was a 43% increase on the same month a year ago and the July figures were a 40% increase. 
But perhaps the most revealing figures are the total value of consents issued since September 2010 when the first earthquake occurred. Since then, $3.7 billion worth of residential and non-residential building consents have been issued in the Greater Christchurch area. Of that total, 2.4 billion was for new residential dwellings and 1.3 billion was for non-residential buildings. So I want to turn now to progress being made in the central city. Last year we released a bold blueprint for the CBD's redevelopment in Christchurch's central recovery plan. It's fair to say I think that the blueprint was very well received. At its heart, the blueprint has a number of major anchor projects, and these include the Convention Centre Precinct, the Retail Precinct, the Bus Interchange, the Justice and Emergency Services Precinct, the Stadium, the Metro Sports Facility, Avon River Precinct, and of course the Health Precinct. In June came a major milestone with a cost-sharing agreement between the Christchurch City Council and the Crown to split the cost of anchor projects and horizontal infrastructure such as roads, water and wastewater. The cost-sharing agreement uh, provides for the Crown to pay $2.9 billion, while at the same time the Council will contribute $1.9 billion. As well as negotiating this agreement, which has provided the certainty required to move forward, land purchase for the anchor projects has been proceeding at pace. As at the 30th of August, agreements had been reached for the purchase of 164 properties, which represents nearly 52% of the total land area required. The Avon River Precinct, which includes Margaret Mayhew's Amazing Place Playground, will be completed by mid-2015 after starting in March. The first pilot section, Watermark, was opened near the end of last month. It's expected that the construction of the con Convention Centre Precinct will start late next year, with early works beginning later this year. And last week, the government re uh, requested expressions of interest for a main contractor to build the Justice and Emergency Services Precinct. When completed, it will accommodate up to 840 justice sector staff and 370 emergency services staff, a total of, of up to 1,200 staff on one large site in the CBD. There will be more news on progress on anchor projects in the coming weeks, but it's not just the anchor projects we are making progress on. In mid-August, uh, it was reported that building consent applications for projects in the CBD worth 43 million had been lodged in the preceding six weeks alone. For months now, in fact, there have been more people building than demolishing in the CBD. In June, the final uh, central city cordon came down and the Defence Forces left, a hugely symbolic day for the city. The stronger Christchurch infrastructure rebuild team, SKIRT, is making very good progress on repairing earthquake damaged roads, freshwater, wastewater and stormwater networks both within the CBD and the greater Christchurch area. Business have been re reopening in the central city. These include critical hotel accommodation needed to support tourism given the city's crucial role as the gateway to the South Island. The move by business back into the CBD is of course gathering pace. So last month, for example, media reported that more than 1,000 workers from big banks are set to return to the central city as their employers negotiate space with developers. So I think everyone would agree that the orderly return of people to live and work in the central business district is a vital part of the recovery. In June, Jerry Brownlee and State Services Minister Jonathan Coleman indicated that the government had received a good response to a call for proposals for public sector office accommodation in the CBD. As you know, with the CBD all but closed since the earthquakes, government departments and agencies have been dispersed in temporary accommodation around Christchurch. So I want to announce today that the government has decided that about 20 public sector departments and agencies will be re relocating into the CBD with the aim that this will occur during 2016. It is planned that they will move into four new buildings around the retail precinct. Negotiations over the leases are ongoing with the developers of the preferred buildings, so I can't go into any more detail about these developments at this stage. However, the move will bring 1,700 government employees into the central CBD. 
They, this will help support the recovery of Central Business District and offer a long-term solution for government office accommodation in the city. It will be a catalyst for more econo economic activity in the CBD with its retail or associated business. The departmental offices will occupy about 24,000 square metres of space in the preferred buildings. The department's relocating will include the Ministry of Social Development, the New Zealand Transport Agency, ACC, the Department of Conservation, Statistics New Zealand, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, the Ministry of Health, Housing New Zealand and the Department of Internal Affairs along with a number of other smaller agencies. The agencies will be clustered so they will work together better and the buildings will be built at least 100% of the building code. Moving from temporary accommodation to these new buildings so rapidly will of course cost more, including the cost of lease tails as temporary accommodation is vacated before existing leases run out. We have been advised that the move will mean a total additional cost of around about $90 million over 20 years or an average of $5.6 million a year from years 2016-17. However, I'll be expecting ministers and their departments to improve on that figure uh, as we get the best value for taxpayer money. The move by these departments into the CBD is an integral part of delivering the Christchurch Central Recovery Plan. And the decisions clearly signal the optimism we have for the future of both the city and the region. I want to turn, <coughs> thanks very much. <laughs> I want to turn now to housing. I want to turn now to housing, if I may. Again, much progress is being made, but before I start outlining some of that progress, I want to talk briefly about the complexity of the unresolved housing-related issues that are being faced here in Canterbury. The government, I have to say, is spending a lot of time and effort on these issues, specifically in relation to TC3 land, the Port Hills, cross leases, and the residential red zone, where a recent court judgment went against the Crown. When we examine some of these individual circumstances, res resolving these issues is very complex and difficult indeed. In relation to the recent residential red zone judgment, the Crown is appealing for a variety of reasons, not least of which is the Cabinet's ability to make unfettered decisions is vital. It's not only vital to the interests of the country, but to the interests of Canterbury as well, because we don't want to see the rebuild um, stall. Jerry Brownlee is leading a process with officials to work through these housing related issues, including the residential red zone, as rapidly as possible to find acceptable solutions. What I can say is that we will continue to work as hard as we possibly can on these issues to find solutions that are fair, are equitable and that are practical to the homeowners given the circumstances that we face. So turning now to progress that has been made on the city's housing, I'm pleased to see that in June, that repairs under the EQC's Fletcher Construction uh, Managed Repair Program hit the halfway mark with 40,000 homes repaired, leaving around 40,000 to go. Jerry Brownlee noted in marking this major milestone uh, that given the extent of residential damage had been, um, had been uh, that it occurred, it was hugely important that confidence in the region's housing stock uh, was maintained. Um, we've, we believe we have instilled that confidence, housing values have been maintained or enhanced and the government is working in partnership with others to address land and housing supply shortages. The other significant achievement has been the near completion of the residential red zone offer program, which has seen the sale and purchase agreement signed with 96% of property owners as of the 27th of August. The government is well aware that a good housing supply is crucial as the city's recovery progresses. The housing market has of course reacted to the huge disruption of the earthquake um, that, and uh, the cause and effect of that and more suppliers coming on stream with new subdivisions and developments occurring. But the government has also been concerned to ensure it plays its part. So after my speech I'll be going to Rangers Park in Limwood to cut the ribbon on a government housing development. 42 uh, new 
Um, 42 new three and four bedroom homes have been built at a cost of $12.5 million. The homes will be used as temporary accommodation for families while their repairs and rebuilds are carried out, with the first tenants due to move in very shortly. Once the demand for the temporary accommodation has eased, the homes will be sold as affordable housing. The earthquakes caused huge damage to housing New Zealand's housing stock, with 95% of its 6,000 properties in the city damaged. In April this year, Housing New Zealand settled its $320 million insurance claim for damages and loss, the single largest insurance payout in New Zealand's history. The settlement has allowed Housing New Zealand to rapidly move ahead to start the repair of damaged homes, as well as to build 700 new homes by the end of 2015. Construction began on the first site of the 700 new builds in May. The, th uh, the three two-bedroom units on the site of St Martin's are in the final stage of completion, demonstrating the pace at which the government is moving. The Housing New Zealand Plan is the biggest housing building programme in this city's history. It equates to a new house being built every working day from now until the last day of 2015. So you can see that there's a great deal being done um, in this area. In the weeks following uh, the, the 22nd February earthquake, I said that Christchurch would uh, once again be the successful, vibrant and beautiful place that was before that disastrous day. As I said at the start of my speech, I grew up here, went to school here and started my working life here. It is a place I believe I know very well. I am as determined as anybody to see uh, my hometown rebuilt into a city that we can all be proud of again, a great place to live in, to work in and to raise a family. I'm determined that we will do a good job of the rebuild. We will do it with speed, but we will also do it properly. The commitment I made on behalf of the government to rebuild in the days after the February 20, uh, 2011 earthquake was absolute and unwavering. Two and a half years on, despite the difficulties, complexity, expense and scale of what we face, that commitment remains unchanged. Thank you very much.